those people. So, so I was asking, if, if someone has lots and lots of connections, why are they so important infection spread? And, and someone said, well, they can spread it to a lot of people. And it's true. If I'm in, in fact, if, if, I, if I'm a person in the population, I have lots and lots of connections. And if I get infected, I, I could spread it to a ton of people like typhoid Mary. I might spread it to hundreds of people per day because I'm serving people in a big kitchen or something like that. That would be disastrous. But what's also more likely, um, if, if, if I have lots of connections, not only if I get infected, I could spread it to a lot of people, but what else is the case? If I have lots and lots of connections, other what else can happen? Infected, they can also infect huh? other ones that are connected to them, but not to us. Well, that's true. They can infect lots of others. And it might be quite likely to be infected to an, another high connection person. You know, another cook in Typhoid Mary's kitchen or another traveling salesman. But there's something else. There's something else that's going on. I've been concentrating. If they get infected, they could spread it to a lot of people. But what else is the other piece about why they're so important? Someone with tons of connections is what? Someone with more connections. It's not just if they get infected, they're more likely to spread it to tons of others. But they're also more likely to what? More likely to get infected in the first place. They're like magnets for infection, right? They're going around and and and, and come in contact with tons of people. They're like a magnet for infections. They're more likely to get infected, and they're more likely, if infected, to pass it on because they have tons of connections. So they're like a, a, you know, an express lane for infections, right? They, they're a magnet for infections and they push it on to tons of people. It's disastrous. They have this double accelerating effect. And that heterogeneity, that variability matters. It's not just the average among, you know, the, how, many how many contacts people have per day on average. It's, it's the variability that kills you. It's the large people with large numbers of connections. Maybe it's 2% of the population, but they may drive 50% of the infections. They may keep an infection alive in the population that would otherwise die out. And this is true for some sexually transmitted infections. Um, it's true for certain other infection types where it's a small core group. Maybe it's 2% of the population but they can spread it to lots and lots of people if they get infected and they're more likely to get infected. And so they keep it going. So heterogeneity has ruses. Um, and looking at the average, you could fool yourself into thinking the basic reproductive number is less than one. This can't survive, but it survives in people who are like magnets for and dissemination vehicles for infection, highly efficient dissemination vehicles. Just bear that in mind. I didn't really emphasize that in class, but but it's a good thing to to bear in mind. Um, with a with a scale free network, you get this power log this log uh, power law distribution. You get this log linear scaling. So the ratio of people who have who have um, if it, it, the if we could compare the ratio of the number of people of K connections versus 2K, no matter how big K is, that ratio is the same. So if it's one compared to two connections, ratio of those number of people versus 100 to 200 connections, ratio of those people, 1,000 versus 2,000 connections, same thing. So if there's a quarter of as many people with two connections as there are with one, there's a quarter of many with 200 connections compared to 100, and a quarter as many of 2,000 connections compared to 1,000. Mm, that ratio, that's, that's the same. And, and it turns out you can plot it out. This is called the power law scaling. The probability of having K connections is proportional to K to the minus gamma, where this is some constant. And if you take the log on both sides, get log of this equals log of C minus gamma of log K. Um, so remember when you when you um, have a 
uh, uh, log of a times b, it's log of a plus log of b. And so you, or there's a log of c plus log of this thing, and log of this thing is minus gamma times log of k. And so if you plot it on a log log plot, where this, this axis you plot log k, and that axis you plot log of p of k, I say log of p of x, it should really be p of k. Come on. Um, get back there. Um, that's what you see. You see, see one of these uh, straight lines, and and you see this for for a shocking number of of, of, of cases. Or, you know, you could be looking at ten versus twenty versus ten connections, or two hundred versus a hundred, or two two thousand versus a thousand. You see this amazingly straight line and, and it, it says there can be lots and lots of connections um yeah and look uh in a very localized network you know infection spreads contagion spreads in a constrained way it tends to spread slower and it can die out more easily there can be these firewalls think about that ring lattice right where if it so happened that some people recovered here it gets it's like a firewall it can't get past that anymore because that's the only way past it and it's all these recovery people that can't get past it or the yeah, same in the other way so it tends to it could bottle it up in the extreme case of a ring lattice and it can it, it constrains the its ability to spread um and in general spread more slowly because it's it can't leap it, it just kind of has to spread incrementally bit by bit in a random uh, or Poisson random or Eridos random or Bernoulli random goes by different names. Poisson retina or, or, or simply random network. Two people are connected with equal probability regardless of their other characteristics. And so there's no sense of like connecting with people nearby me or anything. There's no sense of nearby or just, and, and so it can leap from, you know, if you draw it the network, it's all tangled, My, like, if I'm connected with a person, we're no more likely to have friends in common than I have with anyone else, anywhere else in the population. Um, we're not particularly likely to have common friends just because we're, we're connected. It's just willy-nilly connections. And, and that tends to spread infection you know, very broadly. Sparks can fly across the entire network and it, it, it has very few constraints on, on its spread. It can just leap, leap, leap all across the network. Um, very similar to what you see in a system dynamics network in terms of infection spread, because there's no locality. There's no kind of heterogeneity of position that just kind of spreads. Small world network is like a mix between the two. You remember, remember we have this big ring and we had some connections across the ring, right? And even if they're only a small fraction, like 5%, it can totally change it from a situation where it can get bottled up and spread slowly to a situation where it can leap way across the network, leap, 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 and spread it around. And it doesn't take a large fraction of those connections, 5%, 10%, to start changing it more to something like a, a random network. because. All it takes is some of those long distance connections and it can really leap around in ways that it can affect everyone in the network. All it takes is a small fraction of long distance connections. So most of my connections are local maybe, but uh, the small number that are global lets it leap, leap around. Um, in a scale free we, we talked about, um, it can sort of propagate slowly among the, the ones that don't have many connections and then it hits one of these magnet nodes and it tracks it and then disseminates it and chances are it hits more magnet nodes and it, it circulates and it can stay circulating. I talked a little bit about um, some, some um, embedding and, and state space reconstruction. I'm not planning to test on that, okay? So the idea here is like from data about the world, we can actually if we listen, it's whispering to us about the structure of the system that's generating it. The truth is, when we have these complex systems, if we measure one thing, it's, it's actually telling us about the broader system that gave rise to that one thing. It has information about the broader system that gave rise to it. And if we have the right way of listening, if we give that proper sort of listening, that proper ear, 
we can actually hear it telling us about what structure of the system gave rise to it. From one type of measurement, it can lay out all these different drivers for it, if only we listen in the right way. But I'm not going to test you um, on that. Um, yeah, um, it's it's good stuff. Uh, Nonlinearity. What's what does nonlinearity lead to? What's the big deal about nonlinearity? Look, it means you got to simulate it. In general, you can't solve it in closed form. You can't come up with a formula for it. If you have two interventions, the impact of those together can be very different than the sum of the impact for each in isolation. It's a nonlinear system. You can't take each part of the system, susceptibles, separately simulate them, infective separately simulate them, recovered separately simulate them, and somehow simulate the, the whole system. Um, uh, you can't kind of separate the initial population to these different pins, simulate them separately in that system, and then sum up. No, no, no. You got to simulate them together because it takes two to tango, it takes in a susceptible and an infective. And you can have multiple basins of attraction in the state space where you might have push it over, it goes into this one, it gets stuck there in this bad endemic equilibrium where the health system is overloaded. Or or it could end up in this other one where the health system is treating people quite quick. It's still endemic, but it's treating them really quick. And so it keeps it under control. And, and you can kind of end up in these two states or you can end up in a disease free equilibrium where no one's infected at all. Um, and outside the scope of this course is we can assess stability. That's not something I asked you to do this time, but um, yeah, what, what are some trade-offs, aggregate individual-based models? Look, aggregate models, you can reason about their behavior for all different values of parameters. We could take this model and like ask how would it behave if we change these parameters differently without running it, like we can reason about its, uh, its equilibria, how those would change. Turns out we can reason about the stability of the equilibria, how, how stable they are. Um, uh, often it's quicker to construct them, um, to calibrate it. There's fewer moving parts. Um, um, sometimes it's easier to parameterize. This isn't always the case, that's why I say, Frequently, we can analyze it. We can't take an age-based model right now and analyze its equilibria. Um, we can for a series of OD, ODEs, ordinary differential equations. Um, and we can run them quicker, right? Like running an aggregate model, unless it has tons of heterogeneity, we can run it really quick. And we could double the population size. It doesn't change the population size. We could simulate all of Canadian population in a model like that in a SIRS and SEIRS model or whatever. You just, it's just, it's quick, it's immediate, right? Um, um, less pronounced stochastics, we don't have to run it many, many times to generalize. Um, and, you know, we have time to think about it because we can run it quicker, we can learn from it quicker. But individual-based model, I mean, my gosh, um, you got to think about all the, the extra insights you can get with that, right? You can get in spatial effects, you can get in network effects, you can have people on multiple networks, you can capture people's history over time and ask the people who are getting infected now, what are their characteristics over time? What was their vaccination um, uh, situation and how many of them got infected more than twice before? Um, these are things that are really not feasible. These individual history things are not feasible to realistically accumulate in any quantity in, in, in aggregate models and any texture of aggregate models. You can only capture very, very crude things. Like maybe people who have never gotten infected before versus those who have gotten infected at least once before. You can capture an individual-based model, continuous heterogeneity, like my, my exact height or my exact birth weight or something. I don't have to divide it up into categories. I can keep track of my, my age as a real number rather than as a you know, an age bin, zero to five, five to nine, et cetera, um, 10 to 14 years old. No, 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 I can keep track of the number. Um, I can look at interventions that are very specific, that focus on people with certain histories, people in a certain area, certain regions, what we did for the province during the pandemic. Could look at 
interventions for certain regions of the province, focusing on you know, uh, colonies or focusing on northern communities or focusing on, on um, uh, people in Regina or what have you. Um, uh, we can calibrate to longitudinal data and we can, um, we can um, help compare it to that. Um, uh, we can also examine the impact of uncertainty because we have stochastics and we could see the variability expected. And maybe the variability we see in the world, maybe it looks a bit different from the average modeling result, but it's well within the range of variability that we see in the system. And we could run the system and see the level of variability and compare it to what we see in the world. And we might say, oh, this is actually a good, good enough theory to explain that variability by itself. We don't have to appeal to a different theory. Um, uh, we can examine you know how the infection spreads over networks over space and you know in general we can capture things like individual decision making the fact that i make decisions based on the people around me people i know in my network people in my area um things like that um and that's really valuable there are costs of here you know on, on both sides right aggregate model is really expensive to add heterogeneity adding a single two-way distinction we said it earlier, doubles the running time of this model. And often barely makes a peak, peep in an in individual-based model. So I carry around an extra bit of information. Meanwhile, individual-based model, double the population size, at least double the, the runtime, right? Um, uh, and generally for individual-based models, it's more expensive because I have lots of moving parts. I have to simulate this thing. It's much more expensive to simulate. With 30 million agents, it takes a long time, right? Um, compared to running an SIR model with big numbers in it barely you know, makes it peep in terms of performance issues. Uh, Individual-based models um, you know, take a long time to run each run, but generally you have to run them many times. Why do we have to run an individual-based model many times in general to get really um, sustained insight from it, really robust insight? Why do we run it many times? Individual-based model. Tell me that. Why do we run it many times? Because of stochastics. Yeah, each time will be variable. So to get robust conclusions for it, we run it many times over. Um, and and we see kind of bands of uncertainty. It's exactly what we did for the province. So these are possible futures. And, and this is sort of what, what we think is, is readily possible, et cetera. Um, and also when we show with historic data, we say it's within what the model range of, of prediction. So in general, we have to simulate it many times. So each run is more expensive because so many moving parts, people. and and we have to run it many times. So it's like a lot more expensive. And when we calibrate it, we have to account for those stochastics, right? We're trying to get it to best match data from the world, but what the model, what it produces, what the model produces, is not one thing, it varies by run what, what it produces. Same model, same parameterization. Each time we run it, it produces something different. And we want it to, to match that data, not perfectly, but we want it to be consistent with that data from the world. And, and to do that, we'll typically have to run it many times per parameter, set of parameter values, per parameter assumptions about it. We're trying to find the best set of parameters that allow it to best match data from the world. And, and for each possible set, each candidate set that we're considering, we need to run it many times to make sure we're not seeing just a fluke good match by a fluke by chance. So we run it many times. We try to find the parameter values that give us most reliable results, you know, similar to what we see from the world. And sensitivity analysis, as we're varying parameter assumptions, we want to see how it changes the model results. We have to bear in mind. Even if we run it with the same parameter assumption, again, 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 it will give some variability. Take that into account. Mm. This is some of the trade-offs. And there's another trade-off, which is like when we have an age-based model, there's kind of a, a mirroring in the model. Like we can have 
a model, cities in the model, neighborhoods within the city, households, people, something like that. There's kind of a natural nesting, a natural sort of successive levels of context and captured neatly, naturally in the model. Whereas to the degree we capture them in an aggregate model, it's kind of all at the same level and, and we don't really capture it that effectively. Um, it, it's kind of ham-handed. Um, ladies and gentlemen, first order delay. Here's my first order delay. I have a population, I have death, I have some mortality rate, alpha. What's the formula for this? What's the formula for the number of people dying per unit time? This is mortality rate, probability of death per unit time. This is the population. What's the formula for this? What's the formula for that? For death in terms of population mortality. What's the formula? You should know first order delays very well. Yes, population times alpha. Good. It's exactly right. If this is people. What what are the units of this and this? This is is this people? Is the unit of, of the, the dimension of this people? What is this? People per unit time. This is people per unit time. If you have a stock, and its its dimension is x dimensions of the flow as x over time. It has to be. This is the integral of that. It's just like summing this up over time. So it's got to be time. This has got to be this, whatever this is over time. Um, yeah. Um, uh, let me ask this. If I specified this instead of mortality rate, if, if it was mean time, mean lifetime, mean time alive, like mean mean lifetime, what would the formula for this be? What would the formula be here? If this, if I had said mortality rate, or the rate is one over time, if I instead had a mean time alive, mean lifetime, you know, average lifetime, what, what would the formula be for death? Yeah, population divided by mean lifetime. It has to be. The dimensions work out, right? It's population divided by time. This one is also, if you're alpha times population, it's also a unit of population divided by time because this is of unit one over time, or, or dimension one over time. Units here front, dimensions here front. Let me ask this. If this mortality rate were, gosh, um, if it were 0 0.001, Say, say we're 0 0.01 per day, mortality rate. And suppose I want to change the whole model over to be a per week model. Suppose right now it's per day and it's 0 0.01. Now I want to change it over to be to have time units of weeks. What's the prop, what's the mortality rate now? If it, if it were 0 0.01 per day, what's what's the mortality rate if this is a weekly model? What is it now? <laughs> yeah, alpha times seven. Yeah, 0 0.07 per week. Scales linearly. That's the mathematical. Yep, yep, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And look, the formula looks like this. What's the formula for this? This is this is our this is our first order delay, ladies and gentlemen. The formula goes. The number of people in the stock kind of goes down like this if if inflow is zero. So that's a per month likelihood of death. And it's a first order delay. And, and our formula for this is this time says, what is, the, what is the number of people still in the state? How does that go? What's the formula for this? Give me the formula. What's the formula? What's the form of the formula? There's a formula for this, how this drains down. No inflow, just outflow with a fixed rate. What is this formula? What's the formula that describes how this is changing? How this is draining? What's the formula for it over time? 
It's just one outflow with a fixed rate, first order delay, no inflow. What's the formula for this? Yes, e to the minus alpha times t, or that minus alpha times t is all in the exponent. E to the minus per, per month likelihood of death times time, where time is measured in months. That's what it is. And it starts at what value? It starts at the initial value of the stock. So it's the value of the stock times e, the initial, va initial value of the stock times e to the minus per month likelihood of death times t, or t is number of months. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. And so it goes down. So up here, it's at the initial value of the stock and at time zero. Time is zero, so you have e to the minus per month likelihood of death times zero. e to the minus zero is e to the zero. e to the zero is what? What is e to the zero? What is e to the zero? One. Darn right, it's one. So it's it's one. It's, it's it's the initial value of people here initially, and then it goes down. It goes down. It goes down as e to the minus alpha times t, where alpha is, is this thing times. Please know that. Yeah. Know this division, endogenous, exogenous, ignored. What are endogenous things? What are endogenous things? Those are things, who tells us? So what are things we tell to the model? Which of these we tell to the model? You say, hey, model, assume this. Which are these? Which are those? Which one? Which of these are the things we tell to the model? Exogenous, darn right. What are endogenous things? Those are things what? The model will produce itself. Yeah, the model produces. Model tells us. Right? We, can, we, we can't say like, do this for endogenous thing, like, and at this time, make it this. No, no, no. The model's producing this for this. It's generating it. These are the emergent features of the model that are generated. Exogenous things are things we tell to the model. Endogenous things are things that the model tells to us. And ignored or excluded are things, you know, that we haven't, haven't, um, uh, haven't, you know, incorporated in the model, right? Yeah. Um, Okay, and you know a lot of this is you know refining our mental model, right? As and we might capture that as a cause loop diagram. We learn, we think more sharply over time by building a model of it, sharpening just by thinking about building a model sharpens our thinking, and then seeing the results of the model further sharpens our thinking because we say, whoa, that's totally unrealistic, and we learn what model structure is unrealistic, what model structure is maybe more plausible. And it sharpens our thinking further about what might be plausible in the world. Model is a thinking tool. It's like a thinking prosthesis. Doing it all in their head unaided will be like walking with a broken foot, you know, trying to walk with a broken foot for a mile. It, it, it's going to be a non-starter to reason just totally in, the, in our heads about what certain structure would do. But if we can use a computer, that's like having a motorized wheelchair. It can get us there quite quickly. Yeah. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's 9.30. We've been at this for four hours. That's longer than the exam will be for most of you. So I hope you found this useful. I'll post these recordings forthwith. I'll post these slides even sooner. Hope this is useful. It's been great to work with you tonight. I appreciate all your answers and you know your, your volunteering things, whether improved on base or, or up base, that's the whole point of learning. Putting ideas forward and, and learning from that. That's our feedback loop, a balancing feedback loop. We make mistakes. We learn from the mistakes and we're less likely to make them in the future, okay? Remember that as a principle for life. Learning from our mistakes helps us fail forward, helps us grow, helps us 
accomplish greater things. It's been a pleasure. My throat is sore. And uh, I wish you the best of luck in studying for this. Hopefully this will be an asset. And uh, uh, I look forward to seeing you folks on Thursday uh, for the actual exam. Thank you very much. All the best with your studying for this and your other courses.